Hello, everyone. My name is Charles Davis of the Ultimate Brand Design Channel of Stereo Design FX. I want to welcome you to this podcast. It's going to be a very special recording because I have a very special guest tonight. I'm going to read a little bit of her bio. She is she works for the Publicity Works is a Chicago-based boutique public affairs, political consulting and media relations firm owned and operated by veteran journalist Del Marie. She is also the president of Delco Communications Inc, a television production company which produced the award-winning nationally televised news magazine program street life on pbs but she also in 1996 she became the first african-american press secretary to the democratic national convention miss cobb was a political consultant for the former illinois comptroller dan hines and communications director on the re-election campaign for of divine for cook county state's attorney Ms. Cobb, you have such a, an impressive bio. I'm going to stop there because, mm-hmm. I mean, this <laughs> is so much. But just so people know, this is very special to me because Ms. Cobb and I grew up in the same neighborhood. We come mm-hmm. from Bronzeville in Chicago on 31st and Calumet. We both went to Douglas Grammar School. Ms. Delmarie Ricard, how are you? Fine, so good to see you. Good to see you too. I mean, the last time you would talk to me, you were uh, stepping down or or taking a lower profile role in the political scene in Chicago. Um, I see that didn't work because <laughs> they still put, they still uh, reach out and grab you. So what's been going on? How's life been going for you? Uh, Well, you know, I've been doing what I've been doing now. Um, I started my business in 1990. So it's been Mm -hmm. quite a while that I've been doing the same thing. And um, I've reached legend status, which only means, as I say, it means old (laughs) at this point. Uh, (laughs) But a lot of uh, young reporters and things have discovered me and found out that I'm a treasure trove of information and I can connect the dots for them. And so um, that's been interesting to to have this resurgence and popularity among young journalists, black and white. Isn't that something that we have been at what we do for so long we fell out of popularity, then we became popular again. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That's some divine timing. That's some right. divine stuff there. That's how I look at it because <laughs> I remember the last time we talked, you said, Charles, you need to get involved in the political scene. And I <laughs> never forgot that you told me that. And here it is in another capacity. I'm now looking at brands, the political brands, brand strategies, personal brand and that is the purpose of this particular podcast is to learn how miss dale marie you discovered a resurgence but how did you decide to get into this well i was a television reporter and uh for 10 years And uh, after I was no longer a reporter, I uh, came back home to Chicago and wanted to work for Mayor Harold Washington, who was still, who was Uh, the mayor at the time. Unfortunately, he died a month after I got back to Chicago. And um, I was trying to figure out what my next steps were in terms of um, my career and it just mm-hmm. so happened that it was 1987 it, and um, the presidential campaigns were just starting up. And I decided 
from when I was in high school, I had said I wanted to work a presidential campaign at some point. Of course, at that point, never thinking it was going to happen, just something that I aspired to do. And here I was in, in a position to go after what I had said I wanted to do. And as fate would have it, uh, I got hired by the Jackson campaign for uh, Jesse Jackson. He was running for president in 1988. And I got hired on as his uh, national traveling press secretary. And so when I came home after the you campaign, work with Reverend Jackson. Go ahead. This is yes, impressive. So when Go I ahead. came home after the campaign, it was a matter of how do I meld my two passions, uh, politics and media, and make a living doing them. And that's mm -hmm. how I started my mm -hmm. business because uh, political consulting was just becoming a cottage industry. There weren't very many people doing it at the time, certainly weren't very many black people doing it at the time. And, um, and that's how I started my business. Del Marie, that, that is something that comes from our background and where we were taught to go after our dreams. And you've <laughs> always thought big. Aren't you a Leo too, like me? I am. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought we were. We were born in the same uh, astrological sign. And exactly. we come from that Dr. King, that Dr. King era. Well, you know, dream big. Um, Jesse Jackson, we are somebody. Uh, I'm okay. Judge me by the content of my character and the color of my skin. We've been programmed with that stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and we, we lived were, it out. But, but we I, were programmed by ahead. our parents. <laughs> That's Even true before too. Jackson. <laughs> that, that is so true. Mm -hmm. I remember your, she was your aunt or your grandmother or something. I forget what she was, but she, that raised you. Well, you knew my mother, but I lived in Cincinnati off and, off and, off and on, which was my, my great aunt. Oh, okay. I knew it was two people there. <laughs> so, but here's the next thing. Mm -hmm. You want to talk, you want to talk about that? Why did you do that? <laughs> Well, actually, it was a friend of mine who um, she had wanted to do it. And um, she was in her 70s at the time and said to me, listen, if we're going to do this, we got to do it now because I'm not getting any younger. And, um, uh -huh. and in fact, this is our 10th year anniversary of having done it uh, this year. It was 2014 that we did it in February. And uh, I said, OK, then let's do it. And uh, so that's how we uh, decided to climb it. Plus, it's not a real mountain in terms of what, you know, like Mount Everest. It's really, I describe mm -hmm. it as an extreme hike, <laughs> not necessarily a mountain okay. climb, but an extreme hike. But it was an incredible experience uh, going to Africa to do that. And, um, and the people there are just so pleased because again, you know, you don't get that many black people who are doing it. And, uh, and the uh, natives who are there are just so happy to see African Americans. And so it was a great experience. And again, it was I when I came back, uh, my priest at, at church wanted me to talk about my experience because I had before I left, I asked him to to uh, bless me to make sure that I had a successful <laughs> trip. And, uh, and he said, he says, uh, Father, we ask you to help us uh, overcome mountains. And my sister here is taking you literally. <laughs> 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 and so one of the things I said was, if I hadn't done marathons and, and, uh, I was also a marathon walker. Uh, if I hadn't been a marathon walker, I don't know that I could have done it because it really was the mindset of 
put one foot in front of the other. And that's what you, when you're doing marathons, you get to a point where it's really about putting one foot in front of the other <laughs> towards the end. <laughs> and you know, yeah, you'll get yeah. there. <laughs> you know, you start off fresh and towards the end, it's like, <laughs> okay, God, I just need to put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to talk to you about that because it's like I've been on some some forced marches and stuff like that. That's <laughs> ooh, that's that challenges your mind. It's oh a, yeah, exactly. Once you get over that, it it sort of prepares us for what life is going to present to us. And you and I have both uh, traveled through life taking on whatever because of who we are that oh, absolutely. the white power race doesn't even understand. Right. So next what I so the next part I want to get into is you the subject matter expert. You've been brought into this political stuff what is your take on what's going on? <laughs> no, we're in we're in a very strange time. And what it does, it shows you, and, and I think this is something we have to keep in mind all the time as as people, that uh civility is fragile, democracy is fragile, uh all of those things can be destroyed in a very short time. It may take years and decades in centuries to build, but it only takes a very short period of time to destroy. And we've seen that on multiple occasions. And we happen to be in a period uh, in, in, the, in our democracy and our country where we are very close to watching democracy be destroyed. And again, um, during one of my marathons, when I was in Berlin, I, uh, my last marathon was in Berlin, Germany, and I went on the Holocaust tour. And Ooh. so much of what I'm seeing now is identical to what they were talking about during the Holocaust tour of how people are being groomed, how you start uh, banning books and things like that. All of those things that are happening now happened during uh, the 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 takeover of Hitler of Germany. And so it's just uh -huh. really interesting to see how history repeats itself and people mm -hmm. fall into cults and, and fall into following somebody and they don't even realize they're doing it. Well, that has to do a lot with our media programming us and, and things of that nature. Because uh, back in 2015, when I resurrected my digital marketing company, it was really a web design, but then I saw a bigger picture, and I looked at how African Americans were portrayed on the internet, and it was horrible. And I really felt, well, I had to get back involved, and that's what drew me into the direction I'm on right now. Um, because when I, do you remember this game we used to play it in uh, grammar school called King of the Hill? Mm hmm You remember that? Yes, I do. That's what this looks like to me. <laughs> we have a little story about that, but I'm not going to go into that. You used to play, love to play that game. <laughs> you did. <laughs> right, right there on the corner of 32nd in Calumet, it was a vacant lot with a hill right. on it. Exactly. And we had, and you was playing, well, Queen of the Hill. I'll never forget that. A whole bunch of boys got in trouble. Your, your mama came to school. It was horrible. But anyway, um, that's the way it appears to me, you know. King of the Hill, they throwing mud at each other back and forth like they in the like the kids in the playground to me. That's who I see it, you know, just on a lighthearted level. But 
with me being here in the Philippines, and one of the things that you are passionate about is your Ida B. Wells Foundation. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that? Well, it's a political action committee, and uh, it's called the Ida B. Wells Legacy Committee. We called it Ida's Legacy for short. And the idea behind it was to um, support progressive African-American women candidates. And uh, one of the reasons we st- I started it was because in 2016, of course, after Hillary Clinton lost, uh, we saw white women up in arms forming um, all kinds of political action committees, marching, all of this, you know, up a uh, uh, buyer's remorse. But the fact is they were responsible for Hillary Clinton losing uh, because Ooh. black women voted for Hillary Clinton 94%. White women voted for Hillary 63%. Um, and so I thought, you know, if anybody should be forming a political action committee, It should be African-American women who, at -hmm. this point, we have saved this democracy, you know, at least the last eight elections, if not more. Uh, Because if it weren't for us, it would be, things would be a whole lot worse than they are. And so we, I just thought it would be great to try to support Black women who historically don't run for office, that often they uh, statistics say you have to ask a woman at least seven times before she'll say yes to running for office and then once she decides uh it's about the money african-american women do not raise the same amount of money as their white counterparts and uh which also depending on what office they're running for can be the difference between winning and losing and so i thought as a pack, we w- could help raise money to help support African American women candidates, but also to use whatever money we have as a way to educate our community at large about issues. And so mm-hmm. we have about three or four events a year, and that's what we try to do. Okay, so you're still doing that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else? Um, yeah. Well, at, going back to what you were saying about branding, um, that's exactly uh-huh. what this, you know, I do as a, as a um, consultant. I, I jokingly call it guerrilla branding because you have, <laughs> you know, you only have a couple of months to take somebody from being an unknown in some cases to people voting for that person three to six months later. And so you have to really, um, w- one of the things we talk about in, in politics is that you have to touch a voter minimally six times. And of course more if you are in a position to do it, but a voter has to be touched at least six times in order for you to get their vote. And so, when you're talking about having such a small window uh, to, to make sure that your candidate is known, you really have to know how to touch the voter, get the information out, have a sense of what is important in the community that the voter cares about, and then, um, and then making sure that you brand your candidate in such a way that people know that this is the person I want to vote for. I always say that I, I jokingly say that my candidates are the uncola. And so how do we <laughs> different from the rest of the people uh-huh. who are running? And uh, you want to elevate your client so that they stand out above the crowd. And that means a little bit of everything. I mean, that means how they look, how they speak, what issues they talk about, Uh, you know, again, everything is a production and you have to look at it that way. I mean, people who think, you know, I'm just going to wake up today and run for something, uh, 
you know, you're not going to do that. Those days are actually over in many ways because it takes money now to run for office. Uh, and and uh, I mean, when people talk about a grassroots campaign now, they're talking about five hundred thousand dollars. It's not a grassroots cam campaign in the way we knew campaigning to be when we were growing up. And and so and the early voting part of it has made it even worse because if you're the candidate who is having trouble raising money, then if you're front loading the campaign by early voting, which means if you're getting ready to vote early, earlier in the election, that means I've got to get the information to you sooner than I would ordinarily. So if the election is March 26, but early voting starts February 26, that means I got to get the information to you at least a month earlier so that means I have to have some money up front. And so you're front loading the campaign and that works against a candidate who's having trouble raising money. Well, Del Marie, with, with the way the internet is set up and so much free resources, hasn't that made that a lot easier? No. And that's the mistake that people make. The internet is a supplement. The internet is not a substitute. And that's the mistake people make. You cannot, you, you, you take what you know already and the things that are tried and true and have worked before, and you add on to that the internet and the social media and the, all the other things. You don't take away mm -hmm. from knocking on doors simply because you can send text messages. Uh, people still have to know who you are. And uh, I remember one candidate who's a millennial. Uh, and of course, because she was a millennial, she just knew that she was going to get all the support. And it just so happened that it was right after the um, George Floyd uh, murder. And of course, uh -huh. as we know, all young people were very active and marching and protesting and everything. Ooh. And so she was running and she's a millennial and she was out of that group. So she's running for alderman and she was extremely intelligent. I mean, probably one of the more intelligent clients I've had, uh, well read. And so I, a couple of things I said to her, one, um, well, you know, voters, the people who vote are 50 and above. And she looked at me like I right. was crazy because she's thinking, oh no, I'm a millennial, they're gonna vote for me, especially after everybody's been so engaged. The other thing I said to her <laughs> was, you need a campaign office, because of course she thought, you know, I can do this on the internet. And I'm like, no, you need a campaign office. And so we got a campaign office. The other thing I said, you need a landline. It's like all the her people were like, why would we need a landline? I said, because... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, because all of you all have Go different ahead. prefixes and, and area codes. I said, nobody's going to answer those. I said, if, if people see an area code that's not Chicago, you think people are going to answer those? No, they're not. I said, but nope. if they see on the landline, on the caller ID, I said, because again, remember who your target voter is, 50 and above. So they see caller ID, friends of the candidate they're going, at least you've touched that person, even without knowing you touched them, because whether you, they pick up the phone or not, they still see your name on the caller ID. And so the right. first global call we sent out, um, she got a hundred call backs, calls back from uh, voters who had received her robo call. And she, she was like, oh my God, I can't believe that. I've talked to a hundred people in a half an hour. I haven't talked to that many people. And I said, see, I told you, I said, again, it's not a substitute. It's a, it's a supplement. Right. Right. I get, I, I get that. So, well, just to let you know, just before I left the States, I was working for a nonprofit called Wisconsin Voices. And so I was involved in the, the campaign because Wisconsin Voices is a nonprofit 
advocacy group and they had lost their reputation and I'm in there trying to repair all that stuff. And <laughs> so I got involved in the political world. It was very interesting. I said, I wish I really tried to reach out to you because I was like trying to figure that stuff out. That was, it was <laughs> like, wow, I didn't know it was like that. They were talking about something about be careful going out into the parking lot because there'll be people out there trying to set you up. And I was like, what? I didn't no, know I was from the tumble. I didn't. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Jesse Jackson came up came up there for a, a get out the vote picnic, and this was after he'd had that stroke. It was, you know, he did the best he could. Uh, Barbara Atwater from Washington, mm -hmm. I think that's her name. You know, she she worked from our office, and so I'm the social media guy, and I'm doing all the social media broadcasts. Um, but they were financially strapped and, but it came out really good. It, we reclaimed the company's, um, reputation to the point that we worked with the U S state department on, on a project. So I have some exposure with it and it's been really interesting. Mm -hmm. And right now, what I was really surprised about. How was it working for Hillary Clinton? That must have been really interesting. Well, it, it was uh, interesting working for her. Um, I was a, a, a surrogate speaker for her in 2008. And in 2016, I was her Illinois press secretary. Um, and so uh -huh. If she, unfortunately, if she had run the campaign she ran in 2008, in 2016, she, I believe she would have been president. And uh, that's no through no fault of her of hers necessarily, because I mean, you're a candidate, you're not running the day to day operations of your campaign, not in 50 states. So the idea mm -hmm. that anybody thinks that Ooh, she, no. she or any other candidate is doing that, including Biden, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're crazy. Um, no, uh -huh. you know, but what happened was, again, it, it's, it's really just what we're talking about. This group of people who were doing her 2016 campaign, they were so reliant on social media. They thought everything was going to be done by social media. And, and even when they hired me, they were like, well, we really want to know the metrics. We're, we, want, we want you to keep us on up, up, up to date on the metrics. And I found myself the first week or so, so concerned with the metrics that I wasn't doing the things I know to do, which is pick up the phone and talk to reporters and things <laughs> like that. And I was like, oh no, hell, I'm uh -huh. not doing that. I'm, ta I'm going back to <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, 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 uh, you know, they, they just were not, they just didn't understand that part of it. And at first I thought, it was a rejection of that. And, um, and then I realized after a couple of more campaigns and seeing the same thing play out because of these young people on the campaigns, that it wasn't a rejection. It was simply, they did not know. They only knew the new way. Yeah. They didn't know the old way and they didn't yeah. understand that it has to be both. Right. And so that really was right. to, to me because. the downfall of her campaign. Well, we, we have statistics because I was actually involved in a commissioner campaign. What was it? He was a commissioner for Milwaukee. I helped run his campaign and on social media and he did the, the groundwork because he knew something about it. And what the statistics shows is people in that age group of 50 over, they don't trust social media. Mm -hmm. We got the statistics to show that, you know what they trust? They trust the library. I was totally shocked mm -hmm. that, that as those that are, have not been raised in technology, they just don't trust it. They're very suspicious of it. And 
It's real interesting, but I think upcoming generations, it'll play a bigger role. I really do. But so again, Marie, but again, when I you look really at surprised. Who, yeah, no, but, but again, when you look at who votes is the oh. 50 and, and above. And so you look at the, the young, the, the, the 18 to 24, that age group, uh, as you get older, mm -hmm. the percentage of voting increases. And, um, and so we have to, you know, be realistic. You've got 3%, 18 to 24 pulling 3%, and you've got people over 50 pulling the over, uh, over 50% of the vote, over 50% of the vote. So you have to, mm -hmm. as we always say in politics, you always have to shore up your base. And if you're shoring up your base, that means 50 and over. Right. Because I remember there's that you can actually buy the registration rolls and they show you who votes right. in the district. I didn't right. know they could do all that. That was, right. I was you like, can, you mean they tracking all that? No, we call them hard dims. It was really we, something. Hard dims are those people who have voted in, in the last three elections. And, um, and that means primary and general. And you know, when you have a, a voter who votes in the primary, you have a committed voter because mm -hmm. they're not missing an election. Right. And so that's how you start narrowing who and targeting your voters and in, in terms of who actually mm -hmm. is going to go out and vote. And that's who you want to concentrate on. If, especially if you're limited funds, you can't versus sending out to a whole, the whole community. Well, then now you're targeting your universe and you're making your universe those people who you know are going to go out and vote. Wow. That's some great advice. So we we're going to wrap this up with about 30 minutes. I'll, I'll get a few segments out of this. Is there anything you want the audience to know? Because this is going to go out on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook, mm -hmm. the upcoming election. Is there anything you want these people to know? Well, I, I want people to do their homework um, and not just consume media to the point that they're using it as their only resource of information because the media, mm -hmm. you know, they're human beings. And so you bring your own biases to everything it is you're doing. Plus the other thing I found, especially when I, was working on Jesse Jackson's campaign. And since that was my first time on the other side of the camera, after having been a TV reporter, I, I was shocked to find out uh -huh. how many reporters are followers. Uh, if one reporter says something, then all of a sudden, all the reporters are saying the same thing. And I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, reporters were saying to Jackson when they would interview him, well, your followers, tell me about your followers or your so-and-so. And every time they talked to them, they were talking, they were saying, using the word follower. And after I heard it about two or three times, I pulled his coat and I said, Hey, you can't allow that. When they're talking to you, they're calling your voters followers, which suggests that black people are like lambs. They're just will follow you to slaughter. And there, we're not thoughtful. We're not looking at the issues. I said, because when they talk about Bush's voters, supporters, they say voters. I said, when they talk about Dukakis's, right. Michael Dukakis at the time, they say voters or supporters. They don't say followers. And uh, so I brought it to the attention of one of the reporters and they were not happy at the time <laughs> because we brought it to their attention, but they also didn't realize they were doing it. And so it's those kinds of things that are subliminal, but they, they have an impact, which is why it's imperative for every voter to do their own homework, because what we're hearing in the media, just like now about Biden's um, cognitive ability. Well, uh -huh. You know, the fact that he had to do the State of the Union address for the media to get up off of that. Well, he did the State of the Union address mm -hmm. last year when you were saying it. 
Nothing changed from the State of the Union last year to the State of the Union this year. But because all of a sudden right. that became the narrative, his cognitive ability. And, and uh, so all of those things mean that you as the voter have to do your own individual homework. I mean, I heard had a woman say to me, oh, I don't know, Biden hasn't done anything. And I'm like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard because I've got to tell you that whether we like it or not, Biden has done more than Barack Obama did as president. And, he, and, and, and we have to be truthful in what Biden has done. And I'm actually surprised that he's come off to be the president that he is. Because remember, he tried three times. I met him when he ran against Jackson in 88 and he stepped down because he didn't do well. Uh -huh. And then he ran. And so this was his third try. And this was the one that finally took. And he has actually done more mm -hmm. for everyday people than Barack Obama did. And it doesn't matter the fact that you love Barack Obama. That doesn't take anything from him. It just means that when it comes to policy, we have to give Biden the credit that he mm -hmm. deserves. Well, whose fault is it? They're not letting us know what he did. It's always the mudslinging stuff. Well, there, and that's why I say you have to do so, your own homework. Because, no, we do know. Okay. So these are the things we do know. We do know that he put the first black woman on the Supreme Court. And since that was an issue for me for 30 years, that's a major issue. Because we've had three, okay. four black, white women on the Supreme Court. And Barack Obama had three tries at the apple. And each time he did not pick a black woman. And Biden picked a black woman to be his vice president. Biden is the one who brought prescription drugs down, especially put a cap on diabetes medicine. Who has bought diabetes more than anybody else in terms of <laughs> African Americans? <laughs> right, exactly. Who needs prescription drugs capped better more than anybody else? And and so <laughs> he also strengthened the Affordable Care Act. Um, he's put more he's he's putting judges on on the on the bench. At, a, at an incredible rate. And the only thing that's holding him back is the Congress approving them. Uh, because again, Donald Trump was putting judges on the bench, 40, like 40 going north, and they were conservative judges. So these are things that Biden has done. He passed the infrastructure bill. They've been trying to pass an infrastructure bill for over 20 years, for longer than 20 years. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Jesse Jackson ran on an infrastructure bill. That's how long we've been trying to get one passed. And he finally got one passed. The CHIPS Act, he got that passed, making chips here in America. And I'm seeing how- Oh yeah, I saw that. And black people are getting those Go jobs, ahead. entry level jobs that are making very good money after two or three weeks of being trained. I mean, we have to be. We have Where did to be they open the chips? Where, <coughs> Del Marie? I'm sorry to cut you off. Where did they make the chip manufacturing? Because I saw that they were building a plant down in Texas somewhere. I think, uh, and I just saw a story um, about um, a plant in uh, Arizona, and um, yeah, and okay. It was, and it was talking about uh, some of uh, some black women who had. Um, who were in between jobs and they were having a hard time figuring out what their next steps were and just happened to see an opportunity of a training course and they took it. And now they're, you know, making $50,000 and one has decided that she's uh, going to get her master's to become a mechanical engineer. And this was the same woman who didn't have a job prior to taking this certificate uh, training. So mm -hmm. it's those kinds yeah. of things that we have to just be honest about. And, you know, even when you hear people talk about, uh, well, inflation, well, understand why inflation and why prices are high. Because during COVID, when the other president was in office, 
and and uh, he didn't want to believe COVID was real, and all these businesses and people died. A million people died, and um, because he didn't want to believe COVID was real, Biden came in and he overstimulated the economy, but he had to overstimulate the economy in order to save the economy. And the problem is that these uh -huh. companies, once they saw we were willing to pay these high prices, do you think they were going to come down? They were going to readily say, no. oh, COVID's over. Oh, you were paying $2. Oh, let's go back to one. No, they enjoy making the $2 because if you look at it, <laughs> all these companies are making record profits. Many of them are, are making record profits. Okay. And so you have to understand, I mean, we have to put all of this in context. And, um, and also, uh, even though people are talking about the economy inflation, there have been more jobs created under Biden than there's ever been. Uh, and, uh, and it's been incredible how many jobs there, that have been created. So we have to be honest about so what why he's doing. are the African Americans so upset? Because they're listening you know, to what, what we see. Go ahead. Because they're listening to the media and the media are saying that Biden's not doing anything. So who controls the media? Well, we. <laughs> well, it's just I'm, the way, as I'm you know, asking, since... I saw something on YouTube about it. But, you know, as a, somebody who does branding and marketing, you know, everything is about how you phrase it. You know, if you yep. phrase something negatively. So, you know, so what do you think about uh, Joe Biden in terms of the economy, the inflation being so high? So that's one way to phrase it's it. Not his fault. No, but that's uh, a way to yeah. phrase it because then that already plants a seed in your mind that he's responsible mm -hmm. for inflation being high. On the other hand, if you say, what do you think about Joe Biden and all the jobs he's been able to create during these inflationary times? All of mm -hmm. a sudden it becomes a different answer because you're thinking of it as, oh my God, yeah, look at what he's been able to do, even though these are difficult times. So right. all of it is about how you phrase things. And that's why, again, I tell everybody, if you're researching the next pair of shoes you're going to buy, you're researching the next car you're going to buy, you're researching the next trip you're going to take, how can you not research the next president you're going to pick? Tell Marie, that's a tough question. <laughs> you want to hide something, put it in a book. People just don't read. I mean, they don't. I mean, they don't. We see it when we when we um, look at how people access and read a web design. They're skimming. First oh, three I words, know. last three words, first start paragraph. And it's like, they really doing that? And so, so, so we have the evidence of people are just not processing the information unless they really have a vested interest in the information. And uh, like you said, no, I, I agree with followers. You. No, and I agree with you. That is what's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at it just from, uh, and, it, and it, again, it's because, because of social media and texting that people don't read anymore in terms of thoroughly. I mean, I look at my emails, you send emails to people, you've got questions in there, you're asking them, and then they send the email back, yes. <laughs> it's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to what? Wait a minute. Well, you know what gets me is when we started with emails, because I was there when that first hit, people were getting in their feelings about how the email was written. They were imposing their feelings feelings exactly. into the text and exactly it's like wow <laughs> so i have to catch myself doing that you know if i if i read an email from you now that i have a mental reference of your voice i'll read the email and hear your voice in my head 
Mm-hmm. That's what happened. <laughs> right, right. So if people, if, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, hire you for some PR work, how do they do that? Well, you can always email me at um, dlcobb at thepublicityworks.net. You can always go to Ida's Legacy, which is uh, www.idaslegacy.com. And um, you and you can always find me on the internet if you Google me. I'm all over the place, so they always tell people there's no <laughs> not being able to find me. <laughs> okay, one more thing. How would a young African American girl get involved in if they showed an interest in what you do? Well, I've actually had a lot of interns over the years and they've all done very well. I jokingly say they've all done better than me because they had enough sense to get a job. And so <laughs> they've all done very well. Um, but, the, you know, find, find somebody so you can work and learn and um, so you can absorb it like a sponge. Um, you know, one of the things that my biggest regret right is that I have not been able to find anybody who wants to actually stay and do what it is that I do. And it is hard. I mean, it's not easy because, of course, when you're doing campaigns, there is no tomorrow. Election day is election day, not the day after election day. And so you got to get it done. And uh -huh. if that means staying up all night to mm -hmm. do it, then that's what you got to do. And and so it is it isn't easy. It is it is hard. Uh, they like the glamour part of it, doing interviews and things like that, but right. you know, like the hard part of it, which is staying up all night, trying to make sure that you've got everything just perfect when you send out the direct mail or when you do the video or when you do even the text message, message. everything has to be just right. And so I would say, find somebody who's doing this and uh and 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 ask them and volunteer with them intern with them whatever you have to do but to have an opportunity to see if it's something you actually are interested in and would like doing absolutely del marie i really want to thank you please stay on i'm gonna end the the live stream and we're gonna have to wait till this finish uploading ladies and gentlemen i want to personally thank Ms. Del Marie Cobb for her beautiful insight and what's going on in the political scene and that we have to have exercise our due diligence when analyzing the issues and what the candidates really stand for. I want to thank you for watching this live stream. I'm asking you to like, comment, and share, and thank you for watching.